slide, please. First thing, we're, we're going to start off with a, a presentation from Simon Squire, who uh, I'd like you all to welcome him. He's Head of Cost Planning, Operational Assurance and Performance at Lend Lease, and he's here to talk to us about cost planning and how does cost planning achieve consistency and efficiency within its functions to ensure it provides the ultimate value to the groups it serves and what is the value. So uh, before um, I ask Simon to start to start speaking, if you have any questions, uh, could you type them in the chat feature? Uh, and then at an appropriate time, they'll be read out by Cameron uh, for everybody here, and then Simon will answer them. So without ado, I'd like to hand over to Simon. So hopefully Simon's got his, um, his uh, PowerPoint slide ready to go, and he should be able to share his, um, his uh, screen with us. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Paul. I'm not sure if my presentation popped up onto the screen there, Ben. No, it hasn't come up yet. Okay. I'll try it one more time. I timed it before. It actually takes 26 seconds for it to <laughs> upload for the uh, live. If this doesn't work, I'll just go back to the old school approach and um, hold up the uh, paper sheets. So before we get into this, um, thank you very much for inviting me to join you at your AGM. These are great events and uh, with any institute group, they're only as good as the members who participate. I always like to say it's like a gym membership. It's great to have a gym membership. However, it doesn't do much good unless you actually go to the gym and participate. So a bit more of a background on who I am. Uh, you're probably all aware of Alberto Sanchez. So I work alongside Alberto in Lend Lease. We perform a function across the globe with Lend Lease. We oversee projects in Australia, America, Europe and Asia. I'm also on the executive board of the Australian Institute of Quantity Surveyors and I've been there for the last eight years. Professionally, I've been in the construction sector for 33 years. It's hard to believe how young I look. And my expertise is across building and more recently with Lend Lease in the last four years before we sold them with engineering and services. The roles I've performed, initially it was quantity surveying before I moved over to America where I eventually met my wife. And then I started performing owner's representative services, project management role, then back to quantity surveying, and then I joined Lend Lease in 2010 and became a cost planner. So for the presentation today, I'm going to run through initially at a very high level. What are the simple rules for cost planning without getting into the detail? Make sure we understand the difference between cost planning and estimating. Then start to go through what really is cost planning. What's the value of it? A couple of good takeaways, questions. And then if I've been talking way too quickly and I've explained everything so well and there is no questions, I have a section I call overtime, just in case we have uh, additional time, which I'm sure you'll have a million questions on cost planning. Then as we go through it, welcome your questions. What I do recommend is that if you type your questions in the chat section, it's a good way to capture it. This way, other people who watch this video later on will actually have the opportunity to understand your question, and once we start to hit 10,000, a million views on this video, we'll also know what was your question and give you the uh, credit it's required. But like any good presentation, I can't do all the work. I'm going to ask you all to do an exercise, and Alberto, I'm going to ask you not to participate in this one. And I'm just going to let you know ahead of time, whenever I run this exercise, only about 10% of the people get it right. But seeing as though this is a smart, smart bunch of people, I expect you'll all get this correct. So, I'd like you to read what's on the screen. Okay, now if you can count the Fs on the screen, 
I'll give you about 10 seconds to do this. Okay, in the chat section, if you can actually type in your answer. Typically in a room, what we do for this type of exercise is we get everyone to stand up. And as I start to read out the answers, everyone looks around dumbfounded, realizing why there is so many different answers. Now, the first answer a lot of people come up with is three, counting the F in the large words. No, what most people forget is that there's the Fs on the small ones. It's like when you look at a specification, you skip through all the detail and you only look for the main parts that really count. I would give six as correct, but technically the, tr the right answer is seven. There is one up here. So looking at the people who submitted an answer, no one got it 100% right, but I'd give two people or three people the corrects who had the six. So a congratulations for them. OK, so before we get into what is cost planning, I want to go through what are the basic rules for cost planning. First and most important part of cost planning is listening. So good communication is vital to understand what the client is asking what the project manager is asking, what a development manager, what an architect, what a structural engineer, what a scheduler, what everyone is asking. This is the part where I pretty much would say that you're preparing to launch. And when you launch, you launch with 100 questions. When is the project going to start? What type of contract are we using? What's the existing ground conditions? Is the project staged or phased? Are we getting materials from overseas? Does the client have a requirement to have uh, locally procured items? There's a million questions you ask, sustainability, etc. Then coffee. And I don't mean coffee is just going to have a coffee break. What's really important is that you need to take the time and actually sit down with all participants in an informal setting to make sure you're clear on what they're asking. Some people don't actually like confrontation in a meeting room. So take them outside and buy them a cup of coffee. So if you ever see me working, having a cup of coffee, you always know that I'm working hard. Next one is strategy. Make sure you have a clear idea of what you're trying to achieve. So what is the level of design? When is it required? How much are you performing internally or externally? When is the design complete? What level of market involvement are you getting? what's required of the reviews. There's so many different items you need to go through, but to do that effectively, you also need to communicate with your entire team so you can let them know what you're going to provide and what the obligations are on them. Network, well, we all have a network and one of the good things about an institute such as the AACE is you actually get to connect with one another. Your network that you need to rely on when you're doing a cost plan for a project is You'll not need to chat to other professionals, cost professionals in the industry to see if they're aware of any trends, also to lean on them for information to your supplier, to your vendor market, to your subcontractors, also to your architects, engineers, schedulers, legal team. The list goes on and on. So to rely on your network is vital to make sure that you're getting the latest information. A problem that some of the more junior cost planners would have in the industry is they're so focused on counting and pricing the basic item, they generally forget to rely on a network and to step back and join an institute. So one of the, the strengths of the AACE is definitely in developing a strong network. Um, I like to call this your throw it away and start at the end page. Whenever you're working on a project, you need to start by having a base position. Once you have a base position, then you're able to understand how to improve it, whether you're using benchmarking, KPIs, et cetera. Without having an understanding of what the base cost of the project is, you're generally going to spin your wheels and run around in circles and not know what's the area you need to keep honing on your project. Then the cost plan review. Some people find these very um, unnecessary and also a waste of time once you've been working for seven weeks 
for 15 hours a day. But the important part of a cost plan review is that the people who have been working on the project and who have been that close to the project sometimes don't get a chance to step back and see the big picture. It's like that old elephant uh, story. If you're standing too close to an elephant, all you see is old skin. But when you step back, you realize, oh, shit, I'm actually right up in front of an elephant and I better step back. So the role of the cost plan review is to have someone to come in and ask the question that they may have forgot. How are you approaching latent conditions on a project? Is the level of design adequate to make you comfortable that you've got the right scope of work? Who have you spoken to in the marketplace? How do you know the design's right? Have you tested the uh, consultant on their engineering expertise? Question everything and make sure you can validate it and this is the purpose of the cost plan review. Presentation. So typically, whenever you're doing a cost, you spend 99% of your time going through the detailed work, checking it, making sure you know you've got it right. And then you go to a presentation and you pop up under the screen an Excel spreadsheet. When you do that, you're really doing yourself a disservice. You've done all this expert work. Everyone's looking at you as the expert of the cost on a project and it's your chance to wow them. And I always recommend on a project, start with the high level view in mind, but definitely be able to jump into the detail and answer any question. I always present it like it's a weather presentation. Tell everyone what's happening with the weather, where it's going, what's the risks. If they want to know anything further, let them ask. Okay, that's the first part we've gone through. This section we're going into now, is there any questions at this stage? No? Excellent. So this section we're going into, I like to call it the cost plan versus estimating. It's almost like the Australian Ninja Warrior section. So I'm sure we've all had this type of scenario come up on a project. Uh, Developer manager, project manager says you need a budget for a project, but they haven't got any design. Someone throws a number at them and they start having an argument with you. And that's pretty much the start of the process. I'm sure we're all being familiar with. That's not cost planning. The easy way to compare cost planning is to compare it to estimating. In some stages of the world or some parts of the world, cost planning and estimating are the same or they're opposite but I'm gonna to talk to you about it as if it's coming from Australia. Generally, cost planning and estimating is prepared on very different levels of design. Cost planning is where there is limited design and you fill in the gaps so that you can deliver an outturn cost based on limited information. Whereas in estimating, you're typically working on a completed design with uh, very few gaps in the design process. With the ability to influence design on the cost planning, cost is influencing design, so it's going to make a tremendous impact to the design of a project. Whereas estimating, the design is already locked away. You've really got a limited uh, opportunity to make any changes. Uh, approach to the scope of works. Well, what the scope of work is, is that you need to understand, and this is what comes back from experience. So for someone to become a senior cost planner, an expert in cost planning, you need to have gone through each one of the different components that go into a project, whether it's your concrete slab, whether it's your, uh, your service components that go into a project, uh, whether it's your PV on a solar farm or it's a rail. Each individual component, you need to know the absolute detail of it that you can populate what's missing in the scope of works. It's not something that someone can go into unless they have an expertise in that area. In estimating, you're pretty much pricing what is shown on the drawings. Uh, the pricing, from a cost planning point of view, at the concept of it, you're initially relying on elemental data, whether it's design data or pricing data, to inform the cost in the initial view. Estimating is very detailed and it's all relying on market pricing, whether you can do the work internally or you're relying on external 
subcontractors or vendors to do the work. Uh, the number of options on cost planning, you could be running 50 to 100 different options. The most options I've ever run on a project, when I returned and joined Len Lease in 2010, I, for some reason, put my hand up and said I've worked on basements before. So then I was working on the Barangaroo basement for two years. We went through probably 120 different basement scenarios on that project until we landed on the final scenario. In estimating, all you're doing is you're looking for slight value engineering opportunities that aren't intrinsically going to change the design. Stepping back from the high level, this is a term I use, and when someone first told it to me, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about, but after a while it started to make really sense. Cost planning plans the cost, estimating costs the plan. So very simple, but unless you're understanding what cost is to the process, it doesn't make any sense at all. So I'll say it again, cost planning plans the cost. So you're setting budgets that you can achieve based on benchmarking data, whereas estimating you're just pricing what's shown on the drawings. Now, looking at drawings to give you an Im image of what cost planning would start with in estimating, on the left-hand side, the cost plan diagram is high level and schematic. And trust me, I've had much worse diagrams than that. And estimating is a very detailed set of documentation that, that itemizes everything to the nth degree. Now, if we're looking at the project over the life cycle, cost planning has a set life where it actually works on the project. So cost planning is definitely start at the origination of a project and will start to drop away and estimating starts to come in as we're nearing the development of the detailed design. The handover there really is the engagement with the market where estimating is more of an expert with market involvement, whereas cost planning more manages the design process. Estimating also will flow through the delivery of the project. And when I talk about this, I'm also talking about this particularly from a point of view from Len Lease. So what is cost planning? So cost planning to me has six key pillars. Most importantly, it establishes a financial feasibility of a project, setting up elemental budgets and cost control that ensures that you can deliver a project time after time on budget. So the six pillars are, it's going to establish design priorities through ensuring cost control of the project. Most important that you always need to be doing value optimization of the design. Make, need to make sure you're achieving commercial objectives from the client. Projects generally from a cost planning point of view need to have a stakeholder make an early commitment. So if you're going to put a purchase on land, you need to have the confidence to actually make that early purchase. And with any work we ever do from a cost point of view, most importantly, we need to have great confidence with the stakeholder. So when we're establishing the design priorities on a project, we start with a client brief should get returned within a design brief. And from that, we can start to develop cost control. If a client brief is not well developed, the project will stumble and the design brief will be very much lacking, which makes it difficult to do cost control of the project. What's the key on the project in the design priorities? I've highlighted them. Most importantly, is always make sure you can step back and look at what is the big picture the project is trying to achieve. Has there been a detailed brief prepared? If not, prepare a return brief to make sure everyone is on the same page. Very important to understand what the key drivers are for the client. Sometimes the key driver for the client is not cost, it's time. Other times it's time and not cost. Other times it's cost and time. Some clients will say it's everything, but to understand what's important for a client, 
particularly if they're a uh, rail network, they want to make sure there's least disruption possible for the stakeholders. Uh, very important to understand what are the risks or unusual items on each project. We can all benchmark a project from one site to another, but unless you know what are the key risks that your project is going to incur and what were the risks on other projects, you can then unpack each project and make sure you can compare them. Design metrics to me are everything. If you get the design right and you know how you're going to build it, you're 99% of the way of getting the cost right. And that will also prevent uh, spinning of the wheels so you're not having to redesign a project over and over again, finger pointing, and then also last minute changes. Run through as many design scenarios as you can and make sure you can actually get the most effective solution. Then cost control. So how do you achieve cost control? When I first started as a quantity surveyor, someone I asked the uh, chief engineer, how do you manage cost? And he said, you can't actually manage cost. You can sort of participate in the process. So to me, the control of cost, the most important thing is no surprises. The last thing a client wants to do on a project is have someone come up to them and say, remember how we gave you a budget last week of $100 million? It's now $140 million. Worst scenario you can have on a project. So how do we achieve a project with good cost control? It really is a teamwork. You need to partner with the project management team. If the project management team on the project is not controlling the project, the project is going to have incredible troubles. So having a partnership with the PM, with the delivery firm, with the scheduling team, with the legal team, will actually give you a good opportunity in order to get the control of cost. You need to understand what's the risk on the project so that you can identify those and hopefully work around them. Whenever you're working on a project, start and get an opinion of the cost as soon as possible. Even if you've got an eight week or 20 week process, if you can walk out of that meeting with a good ballpark of where the number is of that project, you can then understand whether or not this project is going to have financial issues. So if you're doing a vertical construction, you run a, a basic uh, GFA scenario on your project, and you can see that your project should be in the order of we'll say 350 to $450 million. And if the client says the budget's $200 million, well, there's obviously something missing and you might wanna have a conversation with all parties to understand how to improve it. Uh, definitely try and get input prior to the design being drawn up. If you spend, if a client spends money on architectural sketches without understanding what that they're trying to achieve and having a budget, then in the end, all they would have is a bunch of cartoon drawings, which won't really add much value except for a uh, to show the family when they get home, because most of those sketches will get thrown out. Commercial assessment on a project is the financial viability of a project to make sure the development and the construction sections marry together so that the project will make money for the client and having accurate cost advice and income advice is important to make sure that project works. I won't run through each one of these items going through, but the final one here I really think is important is manage up and down. You need to manage your team if you're controlling a cost planning team, give them full visibility, and also manage up the chain to make sure everyone's aware of where the cost is heading. Value optimization. Okay, first question I'd ask for any cost planner if they're on a project, are you involved in the design? Are you in the room when the design's getting developed? If not, you've got to ask the question why. There's no point in being uh, the traditional quantity surveyor view of being in the room at the end asking questions. You should be tracking the costs at all times. And if someone says, oops, we didn't realize that this basement has a hydrostatic uh, pressure, and we're going to have to put a hydrostatic slab in there and also put in a dewatering permanent plant. And the thickness of the slab's gone from 400 mil to 1,000 mil thick. Fine, but then you've just added maybe $50 million to your project. 
let people know so that they can make decisions early on. That may change the whole design of the project. Never assume the design's correct, because I'm sure no one's ever taken the area breakdown from an architect. Always look for improvements of design and always look to verify that the design they've been giving you is correct. You've got to remember that if you're working for a contractor or a client and the design's coming from a consultant, they're working to a budget and they may not have gone through and done all the work that they need to do because they've only prepared their cost from a consultant's point of view. Sorry, design. Um, price the base design that was proposed and always look to add improvements. The efficiency that you can get from benchmark data will actually identify where the design is inefficient or over efficient. This will help to add value and also to help give confidence with the client. Uh, commercial objectives. So confidence is really important within a profession. So if someone is ever looking to make an early commitment on a project, they need to make sure they have confidence in the experts who are doing the work. Whether it's estimating, cost planning or quantity setting, it does not matter. And this only gets developed by doing consistent, creditable reports that will add confidence and that the initial budget always matches the end budget. So there's no point in providing a cost in an early stage that has a bunch of exclusions or qualifications, you need to make sure you're pricing a project with the outturn cost uh, in mind. And the only way to validate data is to use historical data and collect that data, benchmark that data, go to sleep thinking about that data, make sure people are analyzing that data. That data is everything you can do. And you need to analyze the design. You need to analyze each component of that design by cost, by element, your prelims of supervision, which is your overheads uh, cost by contractor, and the design component. Uh, commercial objectives need to be satisfied by everyone. No client or commercial group wants to have excess exposure to risk. You, everyone wants to have the optimal design. By giving early advice, you have a much better ability to control cost. And the sooner you can engage with the market, particularly in the current environment, where escalation is almost on the front page of every uh, newspaper article, the more you can actually test the market, the better chance you have of actually giving a more reliable cost. And in the current market, it's a regular conversation you need to be having every week. Uh, stakeholder confidence. So the only way to develop stakeholder confidence is actually to do a very clear presentation, consistently inform them of any forecasts which you see changing. Always look for opportunities to add value to the client's design and do not give surprises. But then again, if it is a surprise, that's fine. Worst thing anyone can do is actually hide a surprise. Best thing to do is share the information and that way a project team can actually work through trying to resolve the item. Um, why is cost planning valuable? So this one here, you're going to look at all these words and go, that's too many words. But what we're going to do is we're going to unpeel all these words. So I've actually summarized this down from probably twice that many words. And I'm not really a word person. I'm more of a numbers person. So this is my abbreviated version. I had uh, a gentleman from Chicago I was working with once. He sent me a lengthy email. His emails were that long. You actually had to take half an hour to read. The response to a question was, is the estimate on time? And in his email, he actually had a joke, which I didn't realize was a joke. He said there's really um, three types of people, those who can count and those who can't. Okay, so let's start with the top section. So cost planning is one of the core capabilities. Uh, Laura, I'll come back to you in one second. I'll just finish this page. Cost planning is one of the core capabilities that underlies an integrated approach. So when you're trying to achieve from a development point of view, it's one of the capabilities that's required. 
provides critical data to manage risk and to make key product decisions or design decisions. Cost planning dramatically increases project certainty and gives senior manager management confidence in decision making. So as we're going to go through, we're going to peel the words out. So the other part is a cost planner is a partner in a bid or a conversion. So very important, you're a part of a team. And I quite like this, that it's someone who brings a voice of reason as to what's possible or probable, where value is defined and risk is mitigated. Cost planning is exceptionally well organized, relentlessly consistent, like any estimating or quantity surveying function. What we provide as a service is that consistent reliability that we always do it the same way. So cost planning is integral to creating a successful and successfully delivering complex projects. Key member of a team working with project management, project managers, consultants and contractors to ensure the project is conceived and designed to achieve the project vision. A good, good cost planner is able to work with an architect to understand their vision for a project and accurately forecast the completed cost. That is done off not resolved documents. So the cost planner will do that by filling in the blanks and making appropriate allowances for what's not shown on the drawings using the efficiencies and benchmarks. But most importantly, it provides direction to a design team. And the only way you can do that is by showing the design team what the design efficiencies are that they need to achieve on a project. So quite simply, cost planning is about establishing an initial cost, tracking the design to make sure it stays with the budget when advised, and if the scope of work increases, we need to understand why and be able to communicate this. Okay, so uh, Laura, actually I'll come back to your questions right at the end. So I've got a few key takeaways. So if anyone ever says to you on a project, cost does not matter, I want you to think about this. So this was a project when I was working in uh, Seattle, Washington in the USA, and the client came to us and said, uh, we'd like to convert this house into a yoga studio. Okay, sure. I'm sure we've all been asked some unusual things. So said to the client, what's the budget? And they said, budget doesn't matter. I said, cool. So do my first estimate, comes up with $800,000 to get this building up to be a, a quite a substantial yoga studio. Then ask the client, what's their budget? 400,000. Oh. So does anyone know who this person is? Melinda Gates. Very good. <laughs> so we were doing work for um, the Gates family on a number of their properties. So if they ever say budget doesn't matter, nonsense. Even the richest person in the world had a budget. Okay, next one, TLA. Sorry, acronyms, three-letter acronyms. So this is a typical meeting that everyone sits in every day. So I was sitting in this meeting and the architect was walking through the design saying, okay, blah, 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 NHCD. And I thought, okay, ask the question, what does NHCD mean? Crickets. So they went on a bit longer because they used the term again. I thought, oh, better understand what they're talking about here. Ask the question again. The architect responds with no idea. So as far as I'm concerned, no such thing as a stupid question, only an answer. And then don't believe anyone who says they don't have a budget. So just say you're working on a project in a city, client says we want the best building in the city, we want to have it sky high, X number of car spaces, etc. Good development manager. Does anyone have any questions? Sure, what's the budget? Well, at this stage, we don't have a budget. Okay. So later that week, go away and prepare the budget. And uh, everyone's like, great, thanks for coming back so quickly. How'd you go with the cost plan? Oh, great, you're welcome. Um, the overall cost is 750 million. Our budget's 500 million. 
I can't tell you how many times this has happened where you go away after a period of time and come back and they go, that doesn't meet our budget. So in summary, cost planning is proactive, not reactive. It's based on evolving information and generally developed where there is limited information at all. It plans the cost, not cost the plan, and ensure we designed cost and not cost the design. Crucial differences there. So, Laura, I see you have a question. I'm going to read your question out. So how does your cost planning approach compare with the AACE estimating approach based on project maturity level from 0% to 100% estimate classes 1 to 5? Well, I've got a very easy question for that. I have no idea. I'm not sure what the different classes are. Do you want to um, expand yeah. that, Laura? So, uh, sorry, actually, Sam, how are you? Oh, so, sorry, Laurie. Yeah, sorry, it's OK. No, go. Okay. Okay. No, the, uh, uh, they have primary char uh, characteristics and secondary characteristics. It's quite complicated, but uh, they, they're aiming to, uh, uh, to set out for clients, actually, what level of expectation they can have at various stages of the actual design. So, okay. Um, okay, that's a good question. So we do have that. So if you have a um, an at the earliest phase class of a project, okay. well then our estimate would have the design would be um, be zero design. Would base it all on GFA. Contingency levels would be at roughly about five percent. Your prelims and supervision would be on a percentage basis. Your margin will be based on a contract type. And the order of accuracy we want to see on that project is probably plus or minus seven percent. So we start off with a very tight line. Mm -hmm. Then, as you step through each um, gate, the contingency level would pretty much drop from five percent to the final one of about three percent. It depends on if you're working on a. Uh, this is for a vertical buildings. It depends if you're working on an existing building or a new building, and what the risks are in ground. Typically, the variances between an engineering project and a vertical construction project are significant mm -hmm. because on a vertical project, it's much easier to identify what's not there. On a horizontal engineering project, mm -hmm. the number of interfaces are significant. And to be honest, they are the most difficult projects to cost because it all comes down to stakeholder engagement. Yeah. How do you uh, rein in the, uh, the designers who uh, want absolute perfection, looking for the Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo finish? Uh, we just don't. You've got to have the um, the backing of the project manager and the owner's rep. If they're not on your side, you haven't got a hope. Yeah. So working on an internal project at Lend Lease, cost planning is charged to actually control the process. And that if the architect is starting to specify something, we just present the premium that you're paying for that component. And then that's the development manager's call whether or not they want to pay the premium. And pretty quickly they won't unless they can get additional revenue. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So there's there's a few more slides I wanted to show. I'll just quickly run through these. These are the um, the backbone of what you need to do to achieve cost control. So the two is the running sheet and benchmarking. So the running sheet is a tracking process to make sure you perform the process as effectively as you can as possible, to have a sheet that tracks everything to get to remove um, fiction and to make fact, to make sure everyone's tracking and you've identified the risks and there's a little as little surprises as possible and you can track the cost at all times so what we do it's a bit hard to see this sheet but i'll try and walk you through it so this is the value you have at the agreed gate so when you have a sign off on a process so this would be your total your contingencies how you're approaching inflation your um, prelims and supervision your design your overhead and profit etc 
then down here is where you enter the details for any component that would come up during each gate process. And then you'd have a live summary tracking the cost at all time. So if you've got your design at uh, say 10%, your 10% value will be up here and you're tracking it all the way through until you get to your next milestone. Then each one of your sheets for each one of these items would actually have a full backup sheet. And the backup sheet would either be tracking your project on a cost, on, an, on a functional cost, or there's also a parking lot so that you can actually identify items that you also want to add to your tracking sheet. So this running sheet, I'll go back to the front. This is vital to make sure you can do cost control on your project as you go through each of your gates. Then the final part, which I've talked about a lot, is your benchmarking. So now having the ability to get your design KPIs up front, and Laurie, this is how you control your designers. You'll give them a very detailed pro forma of design objectives they need to hit gives you a much better ability to actually be able to control the project. So if we're looking, and I apologize for doing uh, vertical projects, but just say we're looking at a commercial tower, you need to understand your efficiency because your efficiency will drive income. You need to understand um, on different levels how efficient your project is. Then you need to make sure your project actually has the right type of facade ratio. So the perimeter on plan or your facade to floor ratio gives you indications of whether or not your project is uh, over-designed or under-designed. And I don't think you can ever have an over-designed project when the cost is coming in low. Then you would look at your core efficiency on your project, and then you'd break your core efficiency down into the numerous sections. So whenever you're given a design for a commercial tower, and someone says your project is going to be X percent efficient, or it's going to have X percent for services, guard lifts, stairs, back of house. Generally, those uh, provisions are light, and there's no point in having those provisions light and locking in a design. You need to make sure you've got the right allowances in there to be able to deliver the project. So by going through and looking at each one of those detailed components, and comparing it to another project, you can start to nut out very early on where there is no design, how effective your cost is. And it's only by being able to drive the design to the nth degree, you can start to achieve cost certainty and deliver a better cost outcome. Um, so next question is, how, how do you cost the premium that architects requires? Yeah, that's a good question. So. If you're working on a project where we have an international architect, generally an international architect initially will come with a one to one and a half percent premium on the design fees. And then it's really about trying to control their ego with the facade and also making sure that the uh, lobby finishes are held within reason. And how we do that on the facade is we'll tell them exactly how much money they've got to design. And then start Sorry, Simon, how do you actually control their egos? Um, how do you cost, for example, a premium that uh, Donald Trump would put on his high rise building without doing an estimate of what it's going to cost? OK, uh, so it still comes back to developing the design efficiencies on the project. We would give them the pro forma that they need to design the building to. So a core efficiency, uh, if it's an apartment, the uh, corridor widths, et cetera. We would work out what on other projects they've worked on for the facade uh, efficiency. We give them a ratio and give them room that they can play with. But we'd let so them so you're really working with benchmarks or guidelines rather than really doing estimates of what the buildings are going to cost. Is that what you're saying? Uh, initially, we want to get the design as efficient as possible before we start pricing it out. 
But what is the what is what you mean by as efficient as possible? What if the architect wants wide corridors and high ceilings on his floor? That really is his prerogative, isn't it? Uh, Provided it's what the architect's budget. working for. And if yeah. we can then compare on projects and show what the premium would be for a cost if they want to increase their floor to floor from 3.8 to 4.1 meters, mm. and we can say on that running sheet, this is going to add five million dollars. On your facade is, articulation. So your um, benchmarking database must be very, very comprehensive in order to do that. Yes. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And even if you don't have extensive data, as long as you understand what your commercial objectives are with those design efficiencies, and if you don't have the partner with the client, the client's not going to control the architect. You're really going to struggle. Mm. You can only control them when you're working with the client. If the client's a third party, it's really difficult. Really difficult. The the role you're describing as a cost planner is really what AAC would de, would define as a cost engineer, uh, and certainly part of cost engineering is being able to estimate. Um, and and in, in your company, you've, you've actually defined, um, put a line between a cost planner and an estimator. So we would actually say they're almost one and the same. You've got to be able, as a, for a cost engineer, you need to be able to estimate. Um, so very interesting. Yeah, the, um, even in the company, the cost planner and the cost estimator, the cost planner will go to the external market for pricing. But then when it comes down to the hard dollar lump sum bidding, the estimator really has that better relationship with the market. Yeah. Simon, in, in the AACE, they have class five, four, three, two, and one, and, and a class five is, you know, where you've got sort of one to two percent of design, which is which is what you're calling cost planning, and yeah. then they go through to a class one, which is where you got fifty to a hundred percent of design. So, the, the, it's more a case of terminology. Uh, and understanding what the terminology you're using and what the terminology AACE is using in their recommended practices. But definitely, when, when you talked about cost planning at the early stages of a project, um, AAC has a different definition. They would call that a class five estimate. Uh, and it is very much understanding the different terminology that the Americans and the Australians use. And in AAC, Australian section, we do struggle a lot with with American terminology, and we don't always agree with it either. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's another question too. What is the horizontal access time? I'm not sure what that yes. is. Oh, sorry, Simon, this is Frank here. Um, I'm looking at your slide that shows these efficient efficiencies in the Power BI um, slide, oh. and it doesn't specify what the horizontal axis is. Oh. Because I took the project names off. Oh, but it's the timeline, yeah? So each one of these, if you go through, is an individual project. So what we can do is we can filter by uh, this is a snapshot. We might have a uh, hundred projects say, in, in Sydney oh, okay. or a particular region. Okay, okay, okay. I can. So I want projects by Sydney, or I want projects globally, I want projects which are from uh, 15 to 30 levels high, and you can yeah. start to hone that down. Yeah, it's a set of projects and each bar represents a project. Correct. Thanks, Simon. OK, if there's no further questions. I want to thank everyone for your time. Um, I won't be remaining on the call for the rest of your um, AGM, but uh, I wish everyone all the best. And I do recommend if, if there are any vacancies, that you definitely put your hand up to uh, volunteer and join the committee. Well, so, Simon, on behalf of uh, of everybody that's here in AAC Australian section, I, I found your uh, presentation very interesting, um, and I do I do understand your terminology. I do understand it's different, but it it is everything you said is extremely valid, and I found it fascinating. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, everyone, and good luck with the rest of your AGM, and I'll forward a copy of this presentation through as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.